welcome. And thank you for joining today's web conference. Welcome to the California ISO webinar. Before we begin, please ensure you've opened the participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted for the duration of the call. We'd like to remind everyone on the audio line that if you're not connected using the new line, please ensure you're dialed in to 1-877-369-5243. Once again, it's 1-877-369-5243 with the new access code of 0315388. Again, that new access code is 0315388. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Radha Madrigal. Please go ahead. Thank you, Adinda. Thanks, everybody, for bearing with us this morning. We're, we were having a little bit of technical difficulties earlier, and we've switched over to a new phone line so we can hear all of you when you ask your questions. Uh, welcome to the California ISO webinar. Today's quarterly webinar is scheduled for two hours and is intended to provide an introduction to an audience that comes from a broad spectrum, from energy sector newcomers to public officials and regulators to ISO veterans who may already be familiar with some various ISO functions. My name is Radha Madrigal, and I'm the lead client trainer in the Customer Readiness Department, and I will be facilitating today's discussion. On behalf of the ISO, thank you for joining us today. Let's take a look at the primary topics we will touch on today. These topics are intended to be high level, to give you a general understanding of the ISO and its functions, and you will be pointed to where you may find more information that is impactful for you. This webinar is being recorded, so if you would like to hear it again or if you think it would be helpful to others at your organization, it will be posted on our Learning Center webpage in approximately three to five business days, along with a copy of these slides. The final slides will also contain some helpful links that relate to the material that we cover today. Along with this recorded webinar and slides are many other informational resources, including computer-based training courses and other initiative-related recorded webinars. I will show you how to find our Learning Center later in this presentation. There will be breaks during the discussion when the operator will open the phone lines for verbal questions and ample time has been set aside for your questions. If you have questions throughout the presentation that you want to have addressed, you can also type your questions in the chat at any time and the moderator will read it on your behalf during the Q&A section. If I can't answer your questions right away, I will research the topic and email a response to everybody who participated and provided their email addresses. Uh, I have about 68 slides to go through, and I'm going to do four question breaks. So we have two hours scheduled for the webinar, and like I said, we have ample time available for your questions, so we'll go ahead and give you plenty of opportunities to ask those. Approximately two-thirds of the United States and more than half of Canada is broken up into nine energy regions. Independent system operators, ISOs, or Regional Transmission Operators, RTOs, are the federally regulated regional organizations that perform the same functions of coordinating, controlling, and monitoring the operation of the electrical power system, as well as acting as a marketplace for wholesale power for these regions. Similar to a stock exchange, an ISO never actually owns or takes title to the energy that is purchased and sold and only acts as the mechanism to bring buyers and sellers of energy and energy services together. The California ISO is one of these entities and resides in the regional area known as the Western Interconnection. Though the ISOs and RTOs have different ways of operating their grids and markets, we all participate together in the ISO-RTO Council that is committed to work together to build a smarter and more efficient grid that is prepared to meet North American market and consumer needs. During this course, we will be focusing on the California ISO, or ISO, and its processes, but it is important to note that if you are doing work with other ISOs, being aware of the differences in how they all operate 
and the terminology used will be a great benefit in allowing your interaction to be more successful. Like many other ISOs, the California ISO is a nonprofit public benefit corporation. We are responsible for the constant and reliable flow of electricity for the health, safety, and welfare of consumers. But unlike a public utility, we are profit neutral, we are independent, and we do not serve end-use customers. We operate the transmission system, but not distribution lines. Those are operated and maintained by the utilities, who also perform maintenance on generators and transmission systems. Unlike the utilities, we do not own any transmission or generation assets, and we do not take ownership of the energy on the system. We do, however, coordinate the maintenance of these grid facilities to ensure sufficient resources are available to meet the needs of consumers. It is our resolve to facilitate a fair and transparent wholesale electricity market, and we accomplish that through our policies, planning, and initiatives. We provide state-of-the-art technology that allows for enhanced situational awareness of the state of the bulk electric grid to help grid operators maintain reliability and keep the lights on. We have a comprehensive transmission planning process to accommodate the needs for system expansion, as well as clearing the way for clean, green resources to access the grid. We actively engage with state and federal entities to support policy and regional goals for integration of more distributed and clean power products and improved coordination over larger geographical areas to enhance reliability and lower costs. The ISO is located in the Western Interconnection, which is represented here. In addition to being an ISO, we are also registered as a Balancing Authority, or BA. While all ISOs are BAs, not all BAs are ISOs. A balancing authority area, or BAA, is a combination or set of intertie points and resources, and the balancing authority is responsible for matching generation and load while maintaining the electric frequency of the grid. There are 39 separate BAs in the West, each with the same core functions of preparing the system for next day operations using resources within their boundaries, as well as taking into account imported energy from neighboring BAs and matching changing supply with changing demand in real time. The ISO is the largest BA in this region, handling an estimated 36% of the electric load in the Western Interconnection. Utilities, such as investor-owned utilities or public utilities, sit inside of the boundaries of a BAA, and their energy may be shared throughout the entire interconnection enhancing reliability through greater resource pools, as well as helping achieve renewable generation targets and managing costs. As this energy is shared between BAAs, continual communication and accurate tracking between the BAs is critical to maintaining situational awareness of grid efficiency. Electronic tagging, or e-tagging, tracks the energy that is scheduled to flow between BAAs. E-tags contain data that allows us to model where energy is being produced and consumed and what transmission lines are being utilized for reliability and for settlement purposes. I have a diagram here that shows the difference between a grid operator and a market operator. On the left-hand side, you can see that a grid operator maintains reliability by balancing supply and demand, operating the system within its limits, making sure the grid is secure in the event of a contingency event, and we orchestrate restoration in case of a system outage. A market operator supports reliability by providing a larger operational footprint, by minimizing costs to balance supply and demand, and by providing non-discriminatory grid access to that supply and demand. We have price transparency that is reflective of system conditions, and we provide compensation or we receive compensation for grid services. So as a grid operator, the ISO makes sure that the lights stay on in our balancing authority area. Every balancing authority area uses different means to do this. We at the California ISO support reliability efforts by running markets for energy and capacity. Additionally, the ISO also handles coordination among BAs 
in its role as a reliability coordinator, which is known, in R, known as RC West. On November 1, 2019, the ISO became the official reliability coordinator of record for 41 electricity balancing authorities and transmission operators across 14 western states and northern Mexico. RC West now has oversight of power grid reliability for balancing authorities and transmission operators in the western interconnection, monitoring compliance for 87% of the load in the western U.S. A reliability coordinator has the highest level of authority and responsibility for the reliable operation of power grids and has wide visibility of bulk electric systems. RC West monitors the interconnected power grids in the West for compliance with federal and regional standards, determines measures to prevent or mitigate system emergencies in day ahead or real-time operations, and leads system restoration following major incidents. The series of milestones the ISO completed to launch this service are listed at the bottom of this slide here. As an ISO and BA, we must adhere to strict oversight from key agencies, which include FERC, NERC, and WEC. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, is the independent U.S. federal entity that is the regulator of our market and as such has jurisdiction over interstate electricity sales, wholesale electric rates, natural gas and oil pipeline rates, reliability standards for the bulk power system, etc. FERC reviews the ISO's market rules and transmission rates to ensure they are just and reasonable and do not create undue preferences or discrimination under the Federal Power Act. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation is the international regulatory authority whose mission is to assure the reliability and security of the bulk power system in North America. NERC works with all the stakeholders to develop and enforce standards for power system operation, physical and cybersecurity, and system operator preparedness, and then enforces compliance with those standards. They also work with the North American Energy Standards Board, or NASB, to develop standards, including e-tagging standards. The Western Electricity Coordinating Council, or WEC, is a nonprofit corporation responsible for coordinating and promoting bulk electric system reliability in the geographic area known as the Western Interconnection, which we displayed on an earlier slide. Here you see an organization chart of how the ISO is structured, which includes the various teams you would most likely interact with. Using our Board of Governors as a starting point, you can see the relationship between departments, committees, and regional entities. Our board is comprised of five members that each serve a staggered three-year term and are appointed by the Governor of California. Our Department of Market Monitoring reports directly to our board and is responsible for ensuring that the market remains competitive by analyzing market trends and market initiatives, identifying potential anti-competitive market behavior or market, market inefficiencies, and enforcing FERC decisions. In order to provide transparency, the Department of Market Monitoring produces regular reports that are available on our website. The main task of the Audit Committee is oversight of the ISO's budget and financial operations, while the Market Surveillance Committee provides the Board with independent oversight of the market. The EIM governing body is ancillary to the Board of Governors and exercises delegated authority from the Board of Governors over Western energy imbalanced market rules. There is also a body of state regulators that includes representation from eight states responsible for advising the EIM governing body and ISO board on matters of interest. There is also a regional issues forum that is the public vehicle for stakeholders to discuss EIM related issues including impacts to neighboring balancing authority areas. Our president and CEO is Steve Berberick. The Transmission Planning and Infrastructure Development Team works on the development of grid infrastructure. 
market policy and performance, works on market design, looks at market performance and integrating renewables into the market, and interacts with California regulatory agencies. The technology or IT division manages the market and system applications as well as all corporate applications. They also maintain the highest standard of cybersecurity that is critical to ensure the safety of grid and market operating systems as well as our customers. Our operations division maintains reliability, runs the market, and manages the process from bid to settlement. The general counsel division is our legal group that works on the ISO tariff and is the group that interacts with FERC, NERC, WEC, and other agencies when it comes to filings, compliance, and regulations. The external and customer affairs team interacts with customers both within the ISO footprint and at the regional level as well. These interactions cover everyday questions as well as forward-looking policies such as improvements to the ISO markets, EIM, and regional integration. Those of us on the customer readiness team, like myself, are part of the external and customer affairs organization. With all of the functions of the ISO, it is imperative that these boards, committees, and departments work effectively together to serve the needs of our customers. So we are not a state agency. We work with these agencies to implement state policy, perform studies, facilitate a fair and transparent wholesale electricity market, and drive innovation. The Air Resource Board's mission is to promote and protect public health, welfare, and ecological resources through the effective and efficient reduction of air pollutants while recognizing and considering the effects on the state's economy. One of their main focuses is limiting greenhouse gas emissions through programs that utilize renewable energy credits, or RECs. Generators can purchase these RECs in order to offset their air emissions and continue to operate their facilities. The California Energy Commission, or CEC, is responsible for the certification of electrical generation facilities as eligible renewable energy resources and adopting regulations for the enforcement of Renewable Portfolio Standard, or RPS, procurement requirements of public-owned utilities. The RPS is currently set at 60% of total energy procurement from eligible renewable energy resources by 2030 and the ISO is active in working to help achieve this goal. We also work with the California Senate and Assembly to affect change in the energy industry. The Water Resources Control Board is focusing on once through cooling issues. We have a number of generators in California that are close to the coast and use seawater to aid in the conversion process of condensing steam back into water, which can have a detrimental effect on marine habitats. The Water Resource Control Board is coordinating a long-term effort with resources to find alternative ways to cool their plants or to possibly retire them. The ISO works with the Public Utilities Commission on resource adequacy and generation procurement. The CPUC implements and administers RPS compliance rules for California's retail sellers of electricity, which include large and small investor-owned utilities, electric service providers, and community choice aggregators. The CPUC adopted a resource adequacy, or RA, policy framework in 2004 in order to ensure the reliability of electric service in California. The CPUC established RA obligations applicable to all load-serving entities, or LSEs, within the CPUC's jurisdiction. The Commission's RA program guides resource procurement and promotes infrastructure investment by requiring that LSEs procure capacity so that capacity is available to the ISO when and where needed. The Integrated Resource Plan is an umbrella planning proceeding to consider all of the Commission's electric procurement policies and programs and ensure California has a safe, reliable, and cost-effective electricity supply. As I mentioned before, Though we are not a state agency, we still want to help shape policies as they affect our customer, as they affect our customers and grid operations. So it is of great benefit for us to work closely with these entities inside California as well as with agencies outside of California.
but we don't just work with regulatory agencies, oversight boards, and state agencies. Partnership with our stakeholders is critical to the success of the ISO. Stakeholder input is essential to ISO planning processes and for the success of new initiatives, from policy development to implementation. We encourage you to participate in our stakeholder engagement opportunities. On our website, under the Stay Informed tab, you will find information on our stakeholder processes. This page lists all of the initiatives we're working on at the ISO and provides all of the papers and meeting schedules for those initiatives, should you be interested in participating in the discussion. We are committed to providing ample chances for stakeholders to provide their input into our market design, implementation, and infrastructure planning activities. The stakeholder process will shape the market design and policies through a series of proposals, meetings, and comment periods, including any changes to our tariff. A great deal of the documentation that we, that we adhere to from a reliability and safety standpoint is defined by federal and regulatory standards. Our primary document is our tariff, which outlines the rates, terms, and conditions under which the ISO operates. The tariff is modified in collaboration with our stakeholders through our stakeholder process. Pertinent FERC rules are codified in our tariff, so any wholesale exchange of electricity in our market comes under their purview. To view our tariff and associated filings, in a more user-friendly way, you can visit our e-tariff viewer that offers convenient access to all ISO-related files that are part of FERC's e-tariff system. We also have business practice manuals, or BPMs. These rules in the tariff can be high level at times, so our BPMs provide detailed rules, procedures, and examples for the administration, operation, planning, and accounting requirements of the ISO and the market that are consistent with the ISO tariff. Adherence to the BPMs is important for orderly operation of the ISO market. We also have operating procedures, which guide the critical step-by-step -step actions of control room tasks. Some of these procedures are posted on our website, while others are confidential. So what is the ISO's primary function? The ISO is registered with NERC as a balancing authority, a transmission operator, a transmission service provider, planning coordinator, market operator, and reliability coordinator. Together, these roles are grouped into three main categories, reliability, infrastructure planning, and market operations. We're going to take a look at each one of these in a little more depth. As our industry moves into the future, we face challenges and competing priorities. Reliability is the foremost grid consideration, but it is not the only consideration. As more renewables and green power products are added into the power mix, as we expand our horizons, we face challenges related to under- or oversupply and the need for more flexibility. When there is more electricity being generated than places to store or export it, or when there is too little supply, it could affect the reliability of the grid. The bottom line is that there are a lot of things that we want to do, but there are cost, time, and impact considerations. Therefore, it is critical that we coordinate with several entities to plan the transmission needs of the ISO Balancing Authority area. Transmission planning at the ISO is an open and transparent process that actively engages stakeholder and public input, and uses the best engineering analysis possible to, to determine short and long-term infrastructure needs of the ISO transmission grid, which is comprised of over 26,000 circuit miles to maintain reliability and bring economic benefit to consumers. The ISO works closely with the CPUC and the CEC throughout the transmission planning process to identify and study reliability, policy-driven, and economically-driven needs. Our transmission planning process begins annually and lasts 15 months. This process has two phases, 
for project definition and evaluation, and a possible third for competitive solicitation for selected projects. In Phase 1, we are developing forward-looking assumptions. In Phase 2, we are performing analyses and identifying transmission needs. If approved by the ISO board, in Phase 3, we select proposals to build needed transmission projects. Just as we have a transmission planning process, we also have a robust generator interconnection process to help resources interconnect to the ISO grid. Our streamlined process helps resource owners understand the steps to interconnecting their resource to the ISO grid by providing requirement compliance information, as well as an assigned interconnection specialist to walk the entity through the entire process from the beginning through commercial operations. Let's take a high-level look at this process. At a high level, the generator interconnection process starts when a resource submits a request to interconnect. This kicks off the generator interconnection process study, uh, kicks off the generator interconnection study to determine reliability impacts to the system and identify any upgrades that need to be made. This study process takes just over two years to complete. After the studies and approval to move forward, interconnection agreements are signed, and then the new resource implementation, or NRI, process begins. Once this process is complete, the resource can begin participating in the market. The tariff allows seven years for a project to reach its commercial operation date after the interconnection request is submitted. An important item to note is how critical it is to pay attention to deadline dates. It is important to keep all projects moving forward as many processes are linked and feed one another. One of the main tasks of the queue management specialist is to make sure the projects in the queue or process are moving along and interconnection customers are meeting their dates to ensure that generation resources can be interconnected in an efficient manner. Before we move on to the next topic, I think this is a good opportunity for a question break. Uh, Adinda, if you will let me know if we have any questions by folks on the phone. To submit a question, please select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the message box provided and send. Alternatively, you may ask a verbal question. Please ensure you're dialed in using the new participant connection line sent via WebEx chat to enable you to enter the phone queue. Once done, you may press pound 2 on your phone keypad, and you'll hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, you may state your question. We do have our first question in the chat. Question from Shagan, what is COD on the prior slide? Okay, COD on the prior slide stands for commercial operation date. So that is the date that they are actually uh, operating in the market. Another question from James. Can transmission-connected projects apply for interconnection under the utility interco interconnection process instead of KISO interconnection process? Um, let's see, James. My understanding of the way that works is that depending on how you are interconnecting will determine whether you are going through the utility process or the transmission system. So if you are connecting to the larger transmission grid, my understanding is that you need to go through the ISO's process. If you're con connecting uh, further along down the line at the dis dis excuse me, tongue -tied, distribution level, that is when you would be um, working with the utilities. James, can you tell me NEM what that stands for in the chat there? Net energy metering. I'm unsure about net energy metering because I don't have um, a lot of exposure to that myself, but what I will do is take a note down and after this call is finished, 
um, I will send an email out um, to get answers, and then I will reply to um, all of you folks who have provided your email addresses, so I will get that answer for you, Jane. We do have another question from Wendy. Which BAA is Kaizo in? Uh, the California ISO is in its own BAA, so we, the ISO, manage the California ISO's balancing authority area. Any other questions? We currently have no further questions in the chat and the phone. Okay, good. So I'll take that other question that I just noted down. I'll send that via email when I get an answer to that. And let's move forward here with the slides. We're going to be talking about markets. So an ISO typically has a competitive energy market, which most BAs do not have. As a registered market operator, we act as a marketplace for wholesale power or basically a clearinghouse under the exclusive jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The ISO wholesale energy market is comprised of distinct day-ahead and real-time processes. The energy products and services traded in our market allow us to meet reliability needs and serve load. The day-ahead energy market enables parties with bilateral agreements to schedule their contracted supply and demand into the market, offload excess supply in the form of energy or ancillary services, and secure pricing due to changes in load forecasts or for incremental changes in demand. Most demand is met in advance of the market through utility-owned or bilaterally procured resources. The ISO's real-time energy market has the hour ahead scheduling process, which enables import and export resources to schedule their megawatts hourly, as well as a 15-minute market, or FMM, that allows variable energy resources, such as wind and solar, to submit energy forecasts and decremental bids closer to the financially binding interval, which increases bid accuracy. The five-minute market is intended to meet the instantaneous demand that shows up in real time. The purpose of the day ahead market is to ensure that there are adequate resources available and deliverable in real time. Energy is the actual electricity needed to meet the demand of the consumers in general. Much of the energy used within California is procured through bilateral contracts outside of the ISO markets. Here, supply is purchased under contract to meet demand. This energy needs to be scheduled into the ISO market so that the ISO can use the information to monitor the physical energy flows on the system. In most cases, energy that is procured outside of the ISO markets is submitted as a self-schedule. The day ahead market enables suppliers to submit into the markets energy not under contract and enables buyers to procure additional supply in the event they do not have enough under contract to meet their demand. We use demand forecasts, which allow us to know how much energy will be needed in real time to meet load requirements. The ISO must project how much energy will be needed and how much will be available for the next day, the day after that, next week, next month, next year, and we do that through robust forecasting processes. The more accurate data we have, the more accurate the demand forecast. Therefore, the ISO is consistently working on improving load, wind, and solar forecasts in the day ahead, hour ahead, and real-time timeframes to keep the lights on and the costs lower for consumers. Now let's conduct a brief overview of the market timelines. We have just talked about both the day ahead and real time markets. And this diagram here shows the relationship between the two. As you can see, they are very similar. The day ahead market opens eight days before the trade date and closes at 10 a.m. the day before. The day ahead market is made up of three market processes that run sequentially. 
First, the ISO runs a market power mitigation test. Bids that fail the test are revised to predetermined limits. These market power mitigation measures are intended to provide the means for the ISO to mitigate the market effects of any conduct that would substantially distort competitive outcomes in the ISO markets, while avoiding unnecessary interference with competitive price signals. The second process is the integrated forward market, which establishes the generation needed to meet bid-in demand. Market prices are set based on bids. And lastly, the residual unit commitment process secures capacity from additional resources in order to meet the forecast demand for the next day. These processes are co-optimized to produce a day-ahead schedule at least cost while meeting local reliability needs. The final step of the day ahead market is to publish the market results at approximately 1300. When the day ahead market is published, this triggers the opening of the real time market. Bids are once again submitted along with base schedules from our EIM participants. Market processes run, bids clear the market, and dispatch orders are sent and received in real time. The market is then settled in our post-market processes. And now we're going to break that down just a little further. This graph represents one hour in the day ahead market. Scheduling coordinators can submit different bid curves for each hour of the day. All of the economic bids and self-schedules, both supply and demand, are placed on a curve. After we, take, after we talk about the market processes, I'll take a little detour and talk about different types of bids. On the left, we have the bid prices, and along the bottom, we have the megawatts. This is very simplified, but the green supply curve represents the supply bids lined up from the least expensive to the most expensive. The blue line has all of the demand bids showing what demand is willing to pay. It is lined up from the most expensive to the least expensive. Where these two lines cross represents the amount of supply and demand megawatts that are clearing in the day ahead market. By clearing in the day ahead market, I mean if a resource submits a successful bid, they will therefore be contributing their generation to meet demand, so we're saying they clear the market. The cheapest resources will clear the market first, followed by the next cheapest option and so forth until the demand is met. When supply matches demand, the market is cleared, and the price of the last resource to offer in, plus other market operation changes, becomes the wholesale price of power. This is the first step in our plan for the next day. The market also procures capacity or ancillary services to meet its reliability requirements. Ancillary services support the reliable operation of the transmission system as it moves electricity from generating sources to retail customers. There are four ancillary services that are procured in real time. Regulation corrects for short-term changes in electricity use that might affect the stability of the power system. These generators are under ISO control through Automatic Generation Control, or AGC which allows us to move these resources every four seconds. Operating reserves are capacity products designed to ensure reliability in the event of a grid disturbance, for example, a large generator going offline unexpectedly. We have two types of these operating reserves. Spinning reserves are synchronized to the grid and available to be dispatched as energy within a 10-minute period. Originally, it referred to increasing the torque applied to a turbine's rotor, but today other types of resources can meet this need. Storage, for example. So think of these, the, these terminology or these titles kind of have a legacy feel to them. Um, not necessarily everything is spinning, but the terminology is still used this way. For non-spinning reserves, these are ones that are not synchronized to the grid but can be synchronized and be available for dispatch within 10 minutes. Think of fast start generation here. 
we have regulatory requirements on how much of each of these services that we need. The ISO procures regulating reserves based on procurement targets set by the ISO to meet WAC standards. Contingency reserves are procured based on targets set by WAC, and we have a residual unit commitment process to meet ISO's system-wide and regional forecasts. So what happens if the amount of energy that clears the market is less than the ISO predicts it will need? We're going to review that residual unit commitment process now. So what happens if the amount of energy that clears the market is less than what the ISO predicts it will need? The market will also analyze bids for residual unit commitment to cover this gap. So let's say here on this chart that we had a total clear demand at a certain point. If we look at the forecast for the following day and see a difference, we have something called a RUC or residual unit commitment that is used to cover this gap. In many cases, this need is fulfilled by supply that is already dedicated due to a resource adequacy program that is part of California's mandate, but other suppliers can also offer to provide this product. The residual unit commitment process is a method of ensuring the reliability of the grid. RUC is used to bridge the gap between what cleared for each hour and day ahead compared to what the demand forecast is for that hour. If a resource is awarded for RUC capacity, they will need to submit an energy bid in real time. There may be a payment for the capacity in day ahead, and if we need the energy in real time, there will be an additional payment at the real time energy price. One more thing we need to discuss is MPM, or market power mitigation. When there are multiple resources available to serve load in an area, prices are competitive. But if there's only one resource available to serve the load, they have the ability to command the price, and this is known as market power. For every hour, the day ahead market runs a test to see if any resource has the potential for market power. If the potential for market power is determined, the resources bid will be mitigated to a more reasonable price if required. Resources, uh, resource bids that are mitigated are reduced to a cost-based bid. Grid operators need an operating plan for the next day in order to ensure reliability. The ISO uses its day ahead market to create that plan. As a result, resources are committed to provide supply to meet the demand that cleared the market, supply to meet the ISO demand forecast, and ancillary services to meet the reliability requirements that we have in place. I mentioned after we talked about the mechanics that we were going to take a closer look at bids. So we're going to do that now, and then we'll take a question break in a couple of slides. Energy bids provide an economic signal indicating a participant's willingness to supply or purchase energy. All of the day ahead energy bids are submitted by scheduling coordinators. When a scheduling coordinator submits a bid for a supply resource, they provide us with the quantity of megawatts they are willing to offer at various price points. As the price increases, the quantity offered increases also. I'll give you 10 megawatts and the I'll give you 10 megawatts if the price is $20, but I'll give you 50 megawatts if the price is $100. So these prices are meant to reflect their cost of providing supply. The bid cap is $1,000, and the bid floor is negative $150. The scheduling coordinators for demand also submit bids, letting the market know how much they are willing to pay to buy megawatts. Here in this scenario, the lower the price, the more they are willing to buy. We also have the ability to submit self-schedules, which are considered to be price takers. 
These are offers to either supply or buy no matter what the price is. For example, a supplier could submit a self-schedule for 100 megawatts of energy. This tells the market that they are planning on generating 100 megawatts tomorrow regardless of the price. Perhaps they have a contract with an LSE to provide those megawatts. On the other side of the coin, a load-serving entity could submit a self-schedule for 100 megawatts of demand in the day-ahead market. This is a signal to the market that they will buy supply no matter what the price is that clears the market. They might do this to ensure that they secure supply to serve their demand in advance of the real-time market because they feel like the price may be higher in real-time than it is in day ahead. All of the scheduling coordinators have submitted their bids into the day ahead market on the day before the operating day, and here's how they stack up. The self-schedules are at the beginning of the curve because they are indifferent to the prices and they will clear the market. As I mentioned before, the place where the supply and demand cross indicates the amount of supply and demand that clears in the day ahead market. In real time, any additional demand that shows up will be served by the real time market at the real time price. So if you look at the demand that is to the right side of the total cleared demand, these quantities will clear in real time. So how does the market decide which resources to commit? Here are some examples. We've got five different resources that bid into the day ahead market at $20. So what differentiates them? The bids that suppliers submit have more than just a bid price for their energy. They also supply additional information, such as the cost for starting up the unit and running at its minimum output. Even though all of these resources have a bid at $20, it may cost more to start up a gas fire generator than a wind resource. So the market will award the wind resource in lieu of the gas fire generator. Additionally, the market looks at whether it's cheaper to start up a resource or use one that's already running. So is it cheaper to keep a resource at its physical minimum or to start up another one? Other inputs into the day ahead market are listed on this slide here when we take a look at the optimization. So we have the bids coming in from the market. The network model is like a map of the transmission system, the load and the generation. It's like a road map of the system. This provides the market with all of the options for flowing the supply to meet the demand. Transmission limits let the market know how many megawatts of supply can flow on each transmission line. We also need to know the attributes of all of the resources that are submitting economic bids in the market. We have a database with all of the participating resources that tells us information such as how long will it take for a resource to start up? What is its ramp rate? How many times per day can it be started up? How long do you have to wait between startups? What is the maximum number of megawatts it can produce? What is the type of fuel it uses and so on? So this informs the market how the resource can be used. We also have forecasts that are used to predict the needs for the next day. These forecasts include demand forecasts as well as weather forecasts, providing insight into energy requirements and also the potential quantity of, renewable, of renewables that might be available. So if it'll be a windy day, the wind turbines may be available, for example. Transmission outages and resource outages will impact the amount of megawatts that can flow, so the market uses this information in determining which resources can be awarded. See a couple of questions here in the chat. So does the ISO weigh the value of ancillary services differently? What is the most valued? For example, spinning versus non-spinning. Uh, William, if you take a look at some of the reports on the ISO website, I believe one is more about, I just I can't remember off the top of my head which one, but you will see higher prices being paid for, for one of those, spinning versus non-spinning. I'm going to have to double check that report after the call um, 
and I can let you know what that is, and I'll also send out a link to all of you um, to that report that I'm talking about. There are market performance reports that will have that type of data for you. There was another question that asked what prevents collusion from energy providers. So we have our Department of Market Monitoring that models, um, or sorry, that monitors participant behavior very closely. And as part of your um, enrolling and becoming a scheduling coordinator, we identify all of your business affiliates and keep track of that information. So there is a lot of analysis that is done um, to ensure that the market is uh, the market participant behavior is competitive. Um, and William, to answer your question in the chat, will the report show market value of all ancillary services? You'll see the prices in the report as well. So you'll see the average prices there. Um, I'll make sure to link to that at the end of this call. So we've talked about inputs into the day ahead market and different things that we look at. We're going to take a look real briefly at the real time market timeline and then open it up for additional questions um, that you might have. So we're going to look at the real-time market now. There are three main timelines in the real-time market. Bids from all market participants and base schedules from the EIM markets are submitted 75 minutes before each trade hour in real time. These bids are used in the hourly processes for intertie transactions the 15-minute market, and the real-time dispatch, which occurs every five minutes. The real-time market fine-tunes the flow of electricity to follow fluctuations in supply and demand. As we move into the real-time market at least five hours ahead, we look at our updated forecast and begin committing resources as necessary. From the time the day-ahead market schedules are posted to 75 minutes before the trade hour, bids can be submitted for the real-time market. We have an hour ahead scheduling process for scheduling energy and ancillary services based on bids submitted by imports. Internal resources will receive advisory schedules for the next hour, and imports and exports will receive financially binding commitments in this hourly time frame. In the real-time unit commitment process, or 15-minute market, the ISO makes final decisions on resource commitments to adjust the day ahead schedule. Energy is paid at the day ahead or real-time prices based on when the resource receives its market award. Inputs into the real-time market include the day ahead results, resource parameters, real-time system information, supplemental energy bids, outage information, and transmission line information. The market results generate real-time dispatches, ancillary service awards, and startup or shutdown instructions. In the five-minute time frame, the five-minute prices are set and energy is dispatched. So we spent a good amount of time talking about markets. Before we talk about reliability, let's take a question break. Um, Adinda, can you check to see if we have any verbal questions? Just a reminder to everyone, pressing pound two will indicate that you wish to ask a question. Once you're dialed in using the new participant connection, you may press pound two to enter the phone queue. We do have a question via chat. Shagan asked, how long after our payments made to suppliers? Um, I'm about to go over the settlements um, a little bit later in the presentation, so I will give you those time frames um, then when we can take a look at how that all plays out on the slide. So stay tuned. Um, after we finish talking about markets and reliability, we'll go into what we call post-market processes, and I'll cover the settlements and the payment disbursements then. Any other questions? We currently have no further questions in the phone queue and chat. Okay, I will move forward. 
oh, there was a quick question. Are there floors and ceilings for ancillary services bids? Yes, the bid floor for ancillary services is zero dollars, and the bid ceiling is two hundred and fifty for ancillary services. All right, so let's move on to reliability. The ISO is responsible for the constant and reliable flow of electricity for the health, safety, and welfare of consumers. Maintaining reliability is a balancing act that requires a lot of expertise and controlling many moving parts. So what is reliability? In short, it's all about keeping the lights on, and our system operations is at the forefront of this task. Our operators are responsible for maintaining the reliability of the grid by balancing supply and demand using various resource types. Operators are located in two control centers, which are continuously connected in real time through instant video conferencing capability. Both control rooms are operated 24-7. And although Folsom is the primary control room, Lincoln is sharing duties, so the entire operation of the grid can be transferred between control rooms at any time. There are multiple redundancies on all systems, providing one of the highest levels of dependability in computer system operations. As mentioned on the previous slide, reliability of the electric grid is a primary focus. So electricity is a unique commodity in that it is produced, delivered, and consumed at nearly the speed of light. And throughout this process, the goal is to maintain grid frequency at 60 hertz in order to keep the system safe and keep the lights on. Electricity is produced by the supply, which consists of generation and imports. Electricity is delivered via transmission and distribution lines and then consumed by the demand, which are the loads and exports. Maintaining this balance between the two is similar to driving on a highway and trying to keep your car at 60 miles an hour. Like a gas pedal on a car, in order to maintain 60 hertz, you either increase or decrease generation to meet the changes in demand. Because of its instantaneous nature, the ISO uses technology that takes a pulse of the system every few seconds, and our highly skilled and trained system operators constantly monitor multiple bits of data to be able to instantly react to fluctuating conditions such as weather changes and sudden supply shortfalls or surpluses. We also have down there at the bottom reserves, so those are the planning reserves that we have uh, made available to us so that if we have to make any of these changes, we have that excess supply as needed. There are a number of different ways to participate in the ISO market, and any interactions where the ISO will provide services requires entities to go through processes that consist of signing contracts and non-disclosure agreements, passing tests, and gaining access to applications as necessary. Depending on the resource capabilities, market participants can elect to bid into the energy and ancillary service markets or sell other electricity products. Physical supply and demand are bids for those resources that have the ability to provide or consume the energy needed on the bulk electric system. Convergence bids or bids for virtual supply or virtual demand are financial positions taken in the day ahead market and liquidated in the real time market. Convergence bidding is designed to reduce the average price differences between day ahead and real time, as well as the volatility of the differences between day ahead and real time prices. Ancillary services are considered capacity products and help maintain the reliability of the grid by ensuring that we have additional resources held back in reserves so that we have the ability to handle different types of contingency events, whether short-term regulation or operational needs that must be covered within a 10-minute window. Residual unit commitment is a way to ensure that the ISO procures enough capacity to meet the day-ahead forecast by bridging the gap between the physical resources that cleared the day-ahead market compared to the forecasted demand for that next day. 
Flexible ramping products provide additional upward and downward flexible ramping capability to account for uncertainty due to demand and renewable forecasting errors in the real-time market. It ensures that some unloaded capacity is reserved to be dispatched as energy if needed. So residual unit commitment is a day-ahead capacity product, and flexible ramping product is a real-time product. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the ISO is now providing reliability coordination services for the majority of the Western interconnection. Over under the financial tab or section, congestion revenue rights are financial instruments made available through allocation and auction processes that enable the rights holders to manage congestion cost variability based on locational marginal pricing. These rights are acquired primarily for offsetting congestion costs that occur in the day ahead market. And finally, we have something called an inter-SC trade, which is an optional accounting service that we offer to help facilitate financial transactions between these scheduling coordinators that are participating in the ISO market. Participating with the ISO depends on the service to be provided. Though there are many ways to interact with the ISO, only a scheduling coordinator is authorized to transact business directly with the ISO. A scheduling coordinator is an entity authorized by the ISO to buy and sell power in the ISO market. Scheduling coordinators bid and schedule their supply into the market or submit demand bids, and then based on the awards, energy flows across the transmission system and is distributed to the consumer by local utilities. If an entity chooses not to become a scheduling coordinator, it would need to contract the services of a certified scheduling coordinator to participate on their behalf. Scheduling coordinators may include convergence bidders, demand response providers, utility-owned generation, independent generators, energy imbalance market participants, and power marketers. There is a process that entities must complete in order to be qualified as a scheduling coordinator, including mandatory training, financial and testing requirements, as well as ongoing adherence to policies. For more information on becoming an SC, visit the ISO website or refer to our business practice manual called Scheduling Coordinator Certification and Termination. I will talk to you a little bit later about business practice manuals as well. The Energy Imbalance Market, or EIM, is an extension of the ISO's real-time market offered to any balancing authority in the western area of North America. It provides a low-cost, low-risk option that balances load and resources automatically and economically. Full market members seamlessly participate in both the day-ahead and the real-time markets, while Energy Imbalance Market, or EIM, entities only participate in the real-time market. Participants are able to submit bids, which will be utilized by the ISO to optimize energy transfer and generation output between all EIM participants in both 15 and 5 minute increments. The ISO operates the only EIM in the West and uses advanced ISO market systems which automatically choose low cost resources to reliably meet customer demand. We have several participants in the EIM market with more planning to join in the coming years. I have a little comparison about EIM here. This shows on the left hand side, in a non-EIM environment, there are a limited pool of balancing resources. There may be the need to carry high levels of reserves, economic inefficiencies, or increased costs to integrate renewables into that location. Whereas in EIM, we have a diversity of balancing resources decreased need for flexible reserves if we are sharing that amongst each other. There's more economic efficiency and decreased integration costs to integrate renewable supply, again, by the ability to share this with those folks that are participating. 
EIM entities benefit from better cost-effective dispatch of internal resources to each EIM area. So you'll see economic transfers that happen between areas, so the area sending power sells supply in excess and the area receiving power does not have to dispatch expensive internal resources. So every time we add an EIM entity, the benefits are realized for that entity, but there are also compounded effects to other EIM entities. So if you take a look at the benefits reports that are located on westerneim.com, you'll see from the trends that the benefits grow in a nonlinear fashion. Now, participating in the energy imbalance market means you're participating in the real-time energy market, but you're still responsible for running your own BAA. Now we're going to move into what I had promised I would say, uh, what I would cover, the post-market processes, where we talk about the financial activity. So each market transaction is distinct and will be accounted for separately in a stack of coded transactions and associated prices based on market activity and data pulled from meters. The image on this slide provides just a high-level depiction of the activity that occurs in the day ahead in real-time markets. So it begins with market, uh, market participants taking various positions by submitting bids and schedules. The market processes run, and we've talked about those market processes in depth, and they provide an optimized solution that is least cost while meeting local reliability needs. These transactions are then tallied on settlement statements by trade date and finally compiled and sent out via invoice or payment advice on a weekly schedule. Our day ahead and real time markets are settled out financially in our post market processes. Our, uh, one principle to keep in mind is that ISO market results are kind of stacked like pancakes. So what happens in the day ahead market stays there and then real-time changes to schedules and their associated prices are stacked separately for accounting purposes for both the 15-minute market and then the five-minute market as well. So entities can review all of these market transactions on their individual settlement statements, which we'll talk about next. So this diagram that we're looking at here simplifies the energy settlements for the day ahead market and two real-time markets. In this example, the resource was awarded 120 megawatts, so let me remove the animation and go back here. So this resource was awarded 120 megawatts in the day ahead. And then incremental and additional 24 megawatts in the 15-minute market, if we're going from 0 to 120, and then in the FMM section you see one from, it went from 120 to 144. And then an additional 12 megawatts in the real-time dispatch. So for this example, 120 megawatts will be paid at the day ahead price. The additional 24 megawatts will be paid at the 15-minute market price. And then for the five-minute dispatch, the additional 12 megawatts on top of that are going to be paid at the real-time five-minute price. So this simplified example demonstrates that each transaction that occurs will be listed separately on the statement for each market as well as for each type of transaction. So of course there's a lot more to settlements and each type of transaction is accounted for separately. We have meter data that is used for billable quantities to represent the energy generated or consumed during a settlement interval. Meter data is collected in one of two ways. The meter can be directly pulled by the ISO or meter data can be sent by the scheduling coordinator for the purpose of reporting the actual performance of the resource. Revenue quality meter data is required by the ISO for entities internal to VBA. A meter installation and certification process by ISO authorized meter inspectors takes place to ensure that meters are up to standard. Raw meter data is acquired directly by the ISO, and the goal is to turn that raw or revenue quality meter data into settlement quality meter data by putting it through our 
V process, which is validation, estimation, and editing. Settlement quality meter data is acceptable for entities external to the ISO, and an annual self-certification process is in place to ensure that metering is accurate. Settlements are the calculation, billing, and invoicing of charges and payments for market and transmission-related activities between market participants and the ISO. The settlement cycle, fo cycle follows a specific timeline and processes for publication of statements, invoices, and payment advices, dispute submittals, and payments. <clears throat> Day-ahead results and real-time results, along with the meter data, flow through the settlements process and output a settlement statement for each trade date. Formulas are associated with each charge code to determine how transactions will be settled. And then these calculations are broken down on the daily settlement statements and then collated into weekly invoices, which identify charges to be remitted and a payment advice that shows what will be paid out. So each entity will receive a series of settlement statements by trade date. Initial settlement statements are only an estimate of the final result, and marginal adjustments may need to be made several months after the trade date. Invoices or payment advices for market transactions are published weekly on Wednesdays and include market transactions from trading days Monday through Sunday of the previous week. Invoices are due for payment by 10 a.m. on the following Tuesday. Payment advices are then dispersed as applicable at 2 p.m. that same Tuesday afternoon. As the ISO is a not-for-profit organization, all of the money that comes into the market gets dispersed back out into the market, with the exception of our grid management charge, or GMC, that covers specified operating costs. This diagram here depicts the daily settlement timeline, which shows how many times trade dates will be processed for adjustments and accurate calculations. This slide shows the timeline as it is today. I do want to point out that we have a current initiative called Market Settlement Timeline Transformation that will be making changes to these dates. So to stay up to date with that initiative, please visit our Stakeholder Processes page to learn more about the changes coming in the future. So as it is right now, T plus three, or the trade date plus three business days, is the first estimated statement that is produced by the reporting system. The next time this data will be processed for updates or changes will be at the T plus 12B milestone which will include any meter data that was submitted by T plus 8B. There are also subsequent statements that are published periodically thereafter. There may or may not be adjustments to future settlement statements, but entities will only be responsible for the amount that changes from the previous settlement statement. So for more information on what happens on each of these dates, we have a section on our learning center for settlements and metering, and we have a series of settlements CBTs, if you're interested in learning more about that, that will cover that in more detail. And a little bit further on, I'll show you where you can find that learning center that we're talking about. So a key point here is that data must be submitted on time in order to allow the settlement process to proceed more quickly. Late meter data impacts settlement statements for the entire market. Therefore, we have rules of conduct in place to outline the specific requirements and expectations of market participants. We also have something called a payment calendar, which keeps track of each calendar day and what settlement activity is occurring on that date. And I'll share a link to that payment calendar with you at the end of these slides as well.
So we are going to, before I show you where to go for more information, we are going to pause here for a question break. I do see a question in the chat asking about a copy of the slides. Absolutely. So this webinar is being recorded. I will post a copy of the slides and the recording at the same time. That will be posted to the Learning Center in approximately three to five business days. So you will get a copy of these slides and also a audio recording uh, and visual of the webinar. I should say a video recording and audio of the webinar that will be posted as well. So you'll get both of those items uh, in three to five business days on the Learning Center. So with that, uh, Adinda, if you would, could you take a look and see if there's anybody that has any verbal questions? Just a reminder, pressing pound two will indicate that you wish to ask a verbal question. Once again, pressing pound two on your device will indicate that you wish to enter the phone queue. I'm seeing two questions about settlement there in the chat. So one of them says that I mentioned changes to the settlements calendar. So we have the, the initiative that you're looking for. It's called Market Settlement Timeline Transformation. So that is the stakeholder process that you're going to want to connect to um, to keep track of that. And then there was another question that said, what are repercussions if payment advice is not paid timely to the ISO? So your invoice that you receive on a Wednesday is due the following Tuesday by 10 a.m. If you don't uh, pay it by 10 a.m., uh, there are a, we keep track of how many times you late and you will incur penalties after so many late payments. And there's other uh, requirements listed in the tariff as well. So you want to uh, make sure that you're paying those in a timely manner. I'm seeing that we don't have any callers in the queue on the phone. Um, someone is asking me if I'll discuss the process for confirming or disputing settlement statements. So I can talk about that at a high level. Um, I think we might have more information about that on our CVTs and also the payment calendar. So let me go back to a slide to give you a visual to go along with the words that I'm saying. So. If you look at this timeline that we're looking at now, there's the first time you get a settlement statement is at T plus 3B. But if you will notice, that does not include any of the actual meter data. So that is only an estimate. So you cannot dispute the T plus 3B statement. But the first time you can submit a dispute. So your T plus 12B, 12 business days after that trade date, that settlement statement will have incorporated into it the meter data that was submitted by T plus 8B. So if we in fact received actual meter data, and I say actual as opposed to the estimated meter data that we had used at the T plus 3B date, if you have a statement with actual meter data on it, then you have the ability to dispute that and you, have, you are given a certain dispute window um, and then that dispute window gives you an opportunity to dispute any charges on that statement. And then going forward, if there's an adjustment made, those adjustments will be shown on the next statement, and then you'll have the ability to, um, on that one, analyze and dispute any incremental changes. So the process for the one trade date takes a number of settlement statements to completely settle that trade date. And depending on the disputes that we receive and any corrections that we need to make, there may be incremental changes that happen uh, as well. So that's kind of towards the far right por portion of the slide in the lighter blue. talks about op uh, optional settlement statements for incremental changes. So you have the ability to dispute your settlement statements in the various windows that are provided to you after each one is published. Keep in mind that that dispute process for that trade date is completely separate from the requirement to uh, have to pay your invoice that you receive. So every invoice uh, that you receive on a Wednesday is due for payment the following Tuesday, regardless of whether or not you have any uh, trade dates in dispute. That is part of your agreement as a market participant and scheduling coordinator is that you're going to pay all of your bills on time. 
there's a question that asks, why does it take a number of months or years to come to a final settlement amount? So typically, we have up to 36 months, so we could be settling one trade date three years later. And the reason why it takes so long to do that is if you imagine a, a number of different disputes coming from different folks, it takes a lot of time to analyze that and then if there are any changes that need to be made to then put those into place and roll those out on the next statement. So it's an iterative process. Um, and the question was what types of disputes are typical. I'm not super close to that process. Um, I think the majority of the disputes that we receive are on something called our bid cost recovery process, which we have not discussed in this webinar. It's not really um, in scope, but there is a settlement CBT on bid cost recovery that you can look at on the Learning Center that will give you a little bit more information about how that works. And that, I think, is where we see the majority of the disputes coming. Um, I, I am sure that there is more detail about those disputes in some of the settlement calls um, that market participants have that uh, you have the ability to dial into. But because I'm not close to that process, I don't have uh, more granular information there. Um, so the question was, so could a generator see changes in settlements up to 36 months? Yes, absolutely. Now, all of that is how it works today. As I said, we have that, um, it's called market settlement timeline transformation. So that is going to adjust the settlements timelines. I am not the trainer on that particular initiative, so I'm not following it very closely. Though I do know that one of the first things that that timeline transformation is going to do is change the date of that first statement to be after the T plus 8B meter data submission timeline so that the very first statement you get is based on actual meter data and is therefore more accurate. So if we start off with the first statement being more accurate based on actual meter data, there will be less need for as much of this iteration back and forth. Um, again, like I said, I'm not uh, clear on all the other pieces of the timeline and how that's changing, um, but that should help shorten the timeline uh, a little bit. So for those of you that want more information on that, that settlement timeline transformation initiative is something that you want to uh, get clued in on. I'll, we'll go over uh, in a couple of pages, we'll talk about the settlements, I mean, sorry, the stakeholder processes, and you'll have the ability to see that on the stakeholder processes page, it lists all the different items that we're talking about, um, and you can plug into the different uh, initiatives that you find uh, most interesting to you, and it'll tell you what meetings to attend, what papers you can read, uh, where you can get the presentations for all of that. Uh, I think I've answered all of the questions about the timeline um, in that over that time period between then and now, Adinda, did we get anybody else on the phone who wanted to ask a question? We currently have no questions in the phone queue. And again, just a reminder to everyone to please press pound two to ask a verbal question. All right, so we're done with the settlements discussion. Now this next couple set of slides is designed to help you find the places on our website that you can get more information from. Because obviously in this brief hour, hour and a half that we had with each other, we can't tell you everything. So here on our main page, uh, there's a number of tabs along the home page. And so today's Outlook, which is kind of where this light bulb is on this visual here, provides real-time information. So you can see the current system demand as well as today's forecasted peak. If you click on that section, it will take you to a page with graphs of the current day's load and available resources. If you're interested in renewable output, you can access the monthly renewable performance reports from the Market and Operations tab. Now, hopefully you can see my mouse, which I don't know if you can, but above this kind of 
image that says greening the electric grid for future generations, you're going to see menu selections along the top. So third in from the right is market and operations, and that is the tab that you would go to and hover over that. And then underneath there says reports and bulletins. There's a whole host of reports and bulletins there. So that's where those market performance reports are going to be. Um, the tab that's called Stay Informed, which is three over from the left, if you hover over that tab, there is a stakeholder processes menu selection. That is the one that you're going to want to um, click on to get to all of the different stakeholder processes that I was just talking about, including that one where we're adjusting the settlement's timeline. We also have a link to uh, Western EIM. So for those folks that are interested in the energy imbalance market, there's a lot of information about EIM over there on that separate website. There's a link to that at the bottom of this page, or you can also get to that from the homepage of kaiso.com. So this site provides a whole bunch of information, resource material, uh, computer-based training specifically for the energy imbalance market. Um, you'll also find the list of active and pending EIM participants on that page. I mentioned that uh, last year we became the reliability coordinator for the West. So reliability is an essential element of operating the electric grid. Uh, we have information about our RC services on the RC West page. You can click on that link here, or if you have specific questions about that, there's the email address on this page, rcwest.kaiso.com, that you can send your questions to. Uh, two good videos to take a look at when you see these slides after I post them in a couple of days. Uh, here are links to two different YouTube videos. Um, you can check out a couple of interviews that we did with our system operators, and so those links are informational, and I encourage you to take a look at that. From the main homepage, we have a link to what we call OASIS, or that, that is our open access, same time information system. So here you'll find real-time data related to the ISO transmission system and its market, such as system demand forecasts, transmission outage and capacity status, market prices, market result data. Some information about resources are proprietary, and we have that um, in another tool specifically for scheduling coordinators. But this here is public information on OASIS, and there's a great deal of information available here. Um, and it allows you to pull data and use it by, for, you, allows anybody to pull data and use it um, for anything that they're interested in here. There was a question in the chat about a fee paid to us for reliability coordinator services. I believe that we, so yes, there is a fee to provide reliability coordinator services, and I believe that we send those bills out on an annual basis. So there's more information about reliability coordination there. I will confirm my understanding about the annual billing piece, and I will send that out in the uh, email that I'm going to send to you. So I'm going to send you a survey that asks you how was the webinar, and I'm also going to send you answers to all these questions that I wasn't able to answer or that I wanted, that I wanted to make sure I got right. So um, I think we bill RC services annually. I'll confirm that, and I'll send that out in that email. What else? Today's Outlook, which I mentioned um, on the home page, this is just a screenshot of the, uh, the different and various things that you can look at. So you'll see demand, you'll see prices, you'll see the opportunity to show. So this data is updated every five minutes in real time. So you'll be able to see our current resource mix, um, all available through the Today's Outlook section. I will say it's our most visited page, so over 200,000 people a year visit this page. Uh, viewers like it because they have the ability to see changing patterns of supply and demand, what the forecasted and actual peaks are each day, um, the energy supply by resource type. It gives you that information about the real-time energy prices and renewable energy production, and you have the ability to look at the various graphs and go back in uh, time, go back a couple of days or months to see what the data was across those dates as well. 
You can also get this data. You don't have to go to the website. We have an app um, called ISO Today. And so this ISO Today app is available through the Google Play or the Apple Store, depending on the kind of phone you have. All of this data that we're looking at on this screen here is also available to you on your smartphone in the ISO Today app. I mentioned I was going to talk to you about business practice manuals. So this is kind of a plug for that here. We have business practice manuals, or BPMs. So our tariff is very um, technical and high level at times and can have a lot of, does have a lot of legal language as it is a legal, our legal um, rules. So the BPMs have more configuration guides and additional information about how we, how we have actually implemented those rules and they're broken out by various lines of business. So we have a BPM that provides detailed rules, procedures, examples, um, for the administration, operation, and planning, um, and accounting requirements of the ISL. So these BPMs are consistent with our tariff, and it's important for you to adhere to not only the rules in the tariff, but kind of the further explanation that we give in the BPMs as well. The process for updating our business practice manuals is a public process. So you have, as a stakeholder, have an ability to participate in this process. This change management process uses a system available through the public website that provides a way to propose changes. If there is language that is unclear to you that you would like spelled out more clearly or it looks to be like there's a piece of data missing that would be helpful for you to have included in that BPM, you submit what is called a proposed revision request, or PRR, into the process. And then after an ISO review, those PRRs are posted to the website, which triggers a stakeholder review and comment period. So then our ISO recommendations are discussed in monthly meetings with stakeholders before we implement any of those changes into the BPM. So you have the ability to um, help us make sure that these BPMs are clear enough for you to understand how to do business with us. Something that I would recommend that you sign up for if you have not already done so is our daily briefing. So there's a lot happening at the ISO and in the industry in general. We have developed this daily briefing to help you stay up to date. It is a once a day summary email of our announcements that we send out. So the daily briefing also includes a summary of news, activities, announcements of upcoming calendar events, different filings that we have, and any new or enhanced feature added to the ISO website. So you have the ability to subscribe to the daily briefing through our main page. If you hover over Stay Informed and then go down to Subscriptions and Notifications, you have the ability to um, submit that there. What is next? Our media page. So with California being at the vanguard of the transmission of the transition, excuse me, to renewable energy, we've got a lot of the world's eyes on us. And they are looking to us for innovation, looking at our technology and strategies for greening the grid. We have a public affairs and media relations team, and these folks are at the heart of our mission to inform, educate, and promote the clean, reliable electricity. I can't even say that sentence properly. Let me try that again. Our mission to inform, educate, and promote the clean, reliable electric system and efficient market of the future. So here, you'll see the media hotline numbers and email addresses to reach out to our media relations team. Um, so you can do so there. We also have, in order to enhance our customer service to our customers and to simplify doing business with the ISO, we provide a comprehensive website for our IT developers that consolidates the technical documents these developers need for our application programming interfaces or APIs. So this allows developers to find connectivity instructions, interface definition files, sample code, URLs, frequently asked questions, and our get started guides, along with a glossary of acronyms and technical terminology common in our specification documents. So 
you need to sign up in order to access the ISO developer site, but you have the ability to do so as well. Learning Center, which is something that I wanted to make sure we shared with you, saving the best for last here. So if you hover over the Participate tab on the main page and then go down to Learning Center, this is where the customer readiness team is going to interface with you and provide you with all of our details. So we are committed to providing you with broad menu of high quality training courses on our market functionality as well as individual market applications. We've organized these courses into areas of focus or tracks, which you see over there on the left. They're designed to be an industry resource for market participants and the general public to learn about electric grids and markets and the ISO's role in the electric system. We are continuing to evolve our training programs and enhance our training material to better meet the various levels of experience, technical levels, and needs of our customers, and to make it a more user-friendly experience. So the computer-based training section, if you click on the computer-based training library, it will break out by the different various tracks, all of the different CBTs that you can have access to, so someone had asked me about the business, I mean, about uh, disputes and which ones were the most common. And I said our most common disputes these days are on the bid cost recovery process. If you go to the settlement section of that CBT library, you can see an explanation CBT about the bid cost recovery process. So we are creating more CBTs and learning bursts to break down some of these complicated subjects into more bite-sized manageable pieces. So keep an eye on this page to find updated content and learning opportunities. Um, someone had asked if they have the ability to get a copy of these slides. So when you go to the Learning Center and you click on the very first track, which is the Market and Operations, inside of that page you will see a link to the Welcome to the ISO webinar recording and also slide deck. If you go there right now, you're going to see the recording that was done in January. In a couple of days, today's recording, uh, once we receive it from our vendor, we'll get today's recording and a copy of today's slides and put those out there. And they will be out there um, in a couple of days, lasting until uh, July, I believe, is when the next time we have our next session. Let's see, this section here, these next two pages are going to be the links that I talked to you about. So these links provide you with additional information on a variety of topics, such as links to different websites for various regulatory agencies, the business practice manuals, our payment calendar, the operating procedures. So links on this page and the following page are going to give you more information uh, today's session was kind of a high-level overview, and some of these pages allow you to take a deeper dive into the sections that most interest you. Folks had questions about interconnection. This page here contains additional links related to the transmission planning and generator interconnection process. Also, we have links to the material that was presented at our resource interconnection fair, which is an educational forum intended to help participants understand the processes involved in connecting resources to the grid. Um, that format that we provide the, the Resource Interconnection Forum in gives you an opportunity to learn about the various aspects of resource interconnection from initiation of a new interconnection request through the commercial operation process. We just had this Resource Interconnection Fair on March 11th. So the information that is posted on those links is, links is very up to date. So you want to take a look at that um, if you want more information there. And then let's see. Before I give you my closing statement, I've talked a lot now, um, I'll give you one last uh, question break opportunity. So uh, Adinda, if you will uh, do me a favor and see if anybody has any verbal questions. Just a reminder to everyone, pressing pound 2 on your device will place you in the phone queue. Once again, pressing pound 2 on your telephone keypad will indicate that you wish to ask a question. 
We currently have no callers in the phone queue. All right, so let's go through some of these um, questions in the chat. And I know that uh, Adinda, I had said, could you read the questions and then I'll answer them? But then I kind of started just reading them because I got <laughs> kind of excited again. So if you wouldn't mind, let's revert back to the, <laughs> to the you ask it so that we have an opportunity for the folks who look at this later to hear the, the verbal question asked from somebody. That would be helpful. Sure, absolutely. Question from Barbara, is there a fee paid to you for RC Reliability Coordinator Services? How is this billed? Okay, yeah, I think we did that one. So yes, we get paid for RC Reliability Coordinator Services. I believe we send those bills out annually. I'm going to confirm that and send that out via email um, in, to the list of folks that had logged in. So yes, on that one. Next question is, Regarding the T-plus settlements, if you determine months, years later that we underpaid, do you charge interest on that as well? If yes, what interest rate do you use? Good question on that, Barbara. Barbara, I am not 100% sure. I know that there is interest collected in various scenarios, and I know also that uh, when folks are due to be let's say folks are owed money under a specific proceeding and the ISO pays those monies out, I believe that also comes with interest. So let me get a little bit more clarity on that for you um, from our settlements folks, and I will answer that question in the email as well. I don't know what that rate would be or how that gets addressed, but I'll get that answer to you. Question from William. With COVID-19, will the CAISO provide more web-based training? A number of the courses are in person. Will that change? I think we are figuring that out as we go along, to be completely frank with you. Um, we had a training that was supposed to happen in person in April, and our workshop classes are interactive and in person. and weren't designed to be a three-day webinar, let's say. So depending on the topic, um, we may end up moving some of them to be online, but I don't think we have decided that yet. Um, I think our team is hoping that we'll be able to get back to business as usual soon. We have a, our next workshop is scheduled to take place in August. And I'm hoping that that will take place in person. And between now and then, I think we'll have to figure out, um, if that isn't the case, what we're going to do with that training class. So I would say we haven't figured that out yet. Stay tuned. If we do decide to move some of our classes and reconfigure them, um, maybe put them into little smaller chunks and put them online, the way you will find out about that is through that daily briefing that we talked about. So we have something called a market notice, which is an email that we send out to everybody in the market who's interested about the ISO and hearing our news. So those market notices, or those, if we decide to roll out more classes, we'll send out a market notice, and that will be rolled up into one of those daily briefing emails that you get. So that's where you would find that information. Question from Kevin. How is RC West and the CAISO separated? Or are they interconnected? I'm, tr I'm trying to understand if that is, if you mean physically from a staffing perspective. So, so I'm going to answer that how I think you mean, and then if that, if I'm not getting at it, Kevin, then then let me know. So we, RC West, that functionality takes place on the same campus, but in a, I would say a separate. Uh, area of the ISO, so we've got the California ISO system operators that are managing the transmission system and the market, and then there is a separate area on the same campus that is RC West, and the RC West function is providing oversight of various BAs in the West, not just the ISO. 
So the ISO, California ISO control room is managing the day-to-day -day activity of running the market and managing reliability. RC West is providing oversight to the ISO and all of the other BAs in the Western Interconnection that have, that are using that service. And so they are taking a, a higher look at managing um, the market or making sure that um, the grid at a, at a higher level is operating effectively and within all of the various prescribed limits and targets. Um, I'm hoping that answers your question. If that's not what you meant, give me a little bit more in the chat and we can give you more details. Okay, looks like that's what it was. All right, so anybody have any other questions before I go into my closing remarks? We currently have no verbal questions in the phone. All right, so we've spent a good amount of time together. Thank you for your patience and your attention. Uh, in a couple of days, I'm going to post this presentation to our learning center under the market and operations path. This presentation and the links inside of it will act as your toolkit to help you find more information on each topic. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with that, you'll also get a uh, recording of today's webinar if you're interested in maybe listening to it again or sharing it with somebody else at your organization. If you have questions or anything uh, that you'd like to discuss further based on what we've talked about here today, or if you want to know where to find out more information or if you're looking for something, send an email to us at customerreadiness at kaiso.com. For those of you who signed in to today's webinar and put in your email address, you will be getting an email from customer training at kaiso.com, a different email address, that will include a link to a survey. We highly uh, encourage you to take a couple of minutes to complete that survey and just let us know how we can better serve your training needs. This concludes our welcome session today. Thank you for your participation. I hope you found it useful and informative, and have a great day. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.